Well, in a section of northern Iraq, U.S. forces are said to be holding strong. They are trying to root out pockets of Iraqi fighters between the cities of Mosul and Kirkuk. In the middle of those two cities lies Erbil. That's where we find our Ben Wiedemann. Ben, what is the latest from there? Well, Judy, the latest is that the city of Mosul, the largest city uh, still under the control of forces loyal to Iraqi President Saddam Hussein, Mosul, uh, was very heavily bombed uh, throughout the morning. We were uh, in Kurdish trenches, right? About 25 miles to the east of Mosul this morning, and we heard some very heavy, heavy bombing of that city. Now, Al Jazeera, the Arabic satellite news channel, uh, does have a live camera in that city and they broadcast some very large explosions from that area. Now, according to Al Jazeera, those blasts were uh, from, among other targets, an Iraqi army munitions uh, depot that was hit there. And really what we've seen for the last two weeks, I'd say, is daily bombing of that city. Now, you also referred to U.S. forces that are gradually approaching the main highway that connects uh, Mosul to the oil-rich region of Kirkuk, where there's also the second largest uh, Iraqi city in the north, still controlled by uh, forces loyal to Saddam Hussein. So as they approach that highway, they really will effectively cut those two uh, cities off from one another. And as we know, U.S. forces uh, now surround Baghdad as well. So it does appear that the Americans and their British uh, allies are beginning to basically choke off and surround all the major cities in Iraq, including in the north. Judy? Ben, can you characterize the, the kind of resistance that they are running into there in, in the area right around Mosul? It, there is resistance. I'd say it's a fairly strong. Uh, for instance, in the area where we are, 25 miles east of Mosul, has been heavily bombed on a daily basis for quite some time. Despite that, the Iraqis are still there. Uh, their artillery is still very much active. We were shelled several times uh, during the morning from the Iraqi positions, This, despite this bombing. So they're there. Now, we do know that there appear to be no Republican guards in that area. We've learned that from several uh, defectors or deserters uh, from the Iraqi positions we've spoken to. Uh, so the... the Resistance is still there. Uh, it's hard to say how coordinated it, it is, uh, but uh, still very much alive and able to respond to the uh, air, air strikes as well as the firing that's coming uh, from the Kurdish forces as well. Judy? All right, CNN's uh, Ben Wiedemann uh, reporting from Erbil, as you were just hearing him describe a uh, uh, heavy uh, coalition bombardment of the city, the critical city of Mosul in the north over the last day. And as he said, it has been going on for days. Wolf, back to you. Judy, th thank you very much, Judy. These are decisive moments in the war, Hyster historic developments unfolding even as we speak right now. Among other things, the Iraqi opposition leader, Ahmed Chalabi, who's been living outside Iraq, is now back inside the country. And reportedly so are about 700 troops from his organization, the Iraqi National Congress. The INC announced the troops are now near Nasiriyah and they intend to fight alongside coalition forces. A spokesman says they will take orders from the coalition commanders. Chalabi is calling on the Iraqi people to help remove what he calls the final remnants of Saddam's regime, but he denies any personal ambition in a post-war Iraq. I'm not a candidate for any position in Iraq, and I don't seek an office. I, uh, my, I think my role ends with the liberation of the country. The American military, I, I think, should stay in Iraq until the first elections are held and a democratic government is established. Uh, I'm not uh, prepared to give a time frame, but we expect to have a constitution ratified within two years. U.S. officials have said uh, the Chalabi and the INC will have a role in post-war Iraq, but it will be just of one, one of many Iraqi groups, exile groups, opposition groups from within uh, Iraq involved. President Bush is expected to arrive in Belfast, Northern Ireland this hour for a war summit with his staunchest ally, the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair. The two men are divided over how big a role the United Nations should play in a post-war Iraq. 
seen that senior White House correspondent John King has already arrived in Be Belfast. He's joining me now live. When I say they're divided, John, how significant of a division is there between the president and the prime minister? Well, Wolf, it depends on who you ask in both administrations. In Washington and London, we were told by senior officials that the, the difference is more on emphasis, that the British are very happy and very eager to talk about a large U.N. role. The Bush White House, much more skeptical of the United Nations, talks about a much more limited role. But what both camps say is that many of these questions simply are not answered yet. So it's hard to say there's a rift about something they haven't quite decided what should be yet. That is one of the goals here in these Belfast talks. Prime Minister Blair arrived just moments ago. President Bush left the White House early this morning and he is on his way both in London and in Washington they say they envision a major role for the United Nations what the White House is adamant about is that the United Nations not run the show after recent conflicts in Kosovo in East Timor and in Afghanistan the United Nations took a lead role the lead role in administering an interim government the White House says that will not be the case in Iraq and earlier today the White House view received what seemed like an endorsement from the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan who says the situation when it comes to Iraq is quite different than those other conflicts. Each crisis has its own um, peculiarities. Iraq is not East Timor and Iraq is not Kosovo. Uh, there are um, uh, um, trained uh, personnel, there is an, a reasonably effective civil service, there are engineers and others who can play a role in, 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 in their own country. And as we've said before, Iraqis have to be responsible for their political future and to control their own natural resources. Now, what the White House wants is for a U.S.-led civil administration to go in when the shooting stops and then to hand power gradually over to an interim Iraqi authority. The White House is saying it would welcome U.N. assistance in that, especially on the humanitarian side. The White House clearly does not want a major political role for the United Nations in post-war Iraq. The British government has talked more openly of a larger consultative role, at least for the United Nations. So the two leaders here in Belfast will try to hash that out, although officials are telling us don't look for anything conclusive out of this summit, but hopefully the two leaders they say will come to a broad outline of what post-war Iraq, post-Saddam Iraq will look like and what subset role the United Nations would take in that. Wolf. John, there's also another uh, element of the post-war strategy, especially important to Prime Minister Blair, but also important to President Bush, namely the so-called roadmap for Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations to once again get off the ground. I understand that's going to be a significant item on the agenda in Northern Ireland as well. It is because Prime Minister Blair believes and many European leaders believe that one way to calm down all the Arab opposition to this war, the opposition to the war across the Arab world, is for the United States to step forward quickly and prove that it is willing to push for peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis and prove, prove that the Bush administration is willing to pressure the Sharon government in Israel to make the concessions necessary to get the parties back on the path to peace. The White House says President Bush is prepared to do that, is prepared to lay the roadmap out. First, they say, though, they need to see proof that the new Palestinian prime minister gets his government up and running and has day-to-day -day management authority. White House officials saying the delays now are on the Palestinian side in getting that government up and running. Once it is up and running, the president promises to put out that roadmap for peace. And we know full well from British officials, Prime Minister Blair will press him here to keep that promise and to put the roadmap out as soon as possible. Wolf. John King in Belfast, Northern Ireland, getting ready for this important summit between the president and the prime minister. Uh, and by the way, within the next 10 minutes or so, we expect Air Force One to touch down in Belfast, Northern Ireland, carrying the president and his entourage. CNN, of course, will have live coverage of that. Also, this important note, you can expect to hear much more about all of today's developments at the Pentagon briefing. That's coming up right at the top of the hour. We expect to hear directly from the defense secretary, Donald Rumsfeld as well as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Richard Myers. They'll be briefing reporters, answering their questions right at the top of the hour, 2 p.m. Eastern time, uh, and we'll, of course, have live coverage of that. Judy, we're standing by for a very, very busy afternoon. We sure are. That Pentagon briefing coming up in 45 minutes. Wolf, now we want to go to one of our correspondents who's been with us from the start of this war, Gary Tuckman. He has been a, at an air base uh, very close to Iraq. Gary, tell us the latest from where you are. Well, Judy, one thing we want to tell you, you say we've been here since the start of the war, and since the start of the war we've been reporting that we've been from an air base, a coalition air base near the Iraqi border. 
The Pentagon has given us authorization now to say that we're at a coalition air base in the nation of Kuwait. We can't tell you the name of the base or where it is in Kuwait, but we have been given authorization to tell you we're in Kuwait. So when you introduce us from now on, you could say we're at an air base in Kuwait. Now, the latest news from the Air Force, the Air Force has given us information to report. We can tell you that the, the air war is continuing as intensely as ever. We've been here for the 17 nights since shock and awe began. There's been absolutely no let up in the number of sorties leaving this base. We are told that the air coverage over Baghdad, which began two nights ago, a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week air coverage over Baghdad, will only be expanded. Initially, we were told there would always be two Air Force planes flying over Baghdad, asking, acting as dispatchers of sorts. Whenever other planes were needed, attack planes or fighter planes, they would dispatch them, and there would be at least six planes ready to come in over Baghdad. We're now told there will always be more than two planes over Baghdad with the increased number of troops there. Also, regarding the Baghdad International Airport, it's surmised that ultimately it will be a base of operations for Air Force aircraft. Already a C-130 transport plane has flown into the airport, but as of now, the Air Force is telling us there are no Air Force aircraft based at Baghdad International Airport, the new name it's been given formerly Saddam International Airport. Finally, we want to tell you the most recent 24-hour period, 1,850 sorties over Iraq. The highest number there's been since this war began 2,000, the lowest about 1,400. So you can see the air war does continue as intensely as ever. At this point, over the 17 days of the shock and awe campaign, there have been more than 29,000 sorties. Judy, back to you. Gary, now that uh, U.S. forces are not only on the outskirts of Baghdad, they are making regular forays into the city. Some of them battalions are staying there. How does that affect the, the air campaign over the city? Well, the Air Force considers it more important than ever to have a very hardy presence over Baghdad, and that's why they're very specifically saying and telling us they will now have even more planes over the city at all times. There will not be a time of the day where there aren't a considerable number of planes flying over Iraq's capital city. Thanks, uh, Gary Tuckman. Uh, I was thinking in terms of accuracy being even more important than ever before. Of course, that has always been of paramount importance. Gary Tuckman reporting uh, for us from an air base in Kuwait, as we're now authorized to say. Well, as we've been showing you a lot of military developments to talk about today, Lieutenant General Dan Christman is here. We'll talk about the Tigris River Bridge, Saddam's palaces, and more. Then we'll go inside one of those palaces, this one in Basra. See what's inside from top to bottom. And later, one possible hiding place for Saddam Hussein, what his bunker might look like. AM. Live pictures from the northern city of Mosul show huge fires and explosions from a burning ammunition dump. CNN's Jane Araf reports later that U.S. forces are trying to dislodge Iraqi fighters between Mosul and Kirkuk. 3.17 AM. Associated Press quotes a British officer who says the body of Ali Hassan al-Majid has been found in Basra. Al-Majid, Saddam Hussein's cousin, is known as Chemical Ali because of his use of chemical weapons against Iraqi Kurds in 1988. 5.02 a.m., CNN's Walter Rogers reports U.S. Army sources tell him an Iraqi missile hit the Tactical Operations Center for the 2nd Brigade, 3rd Infantry, resulting in U.S. casualties. 6.45 a.m., President Bush departs the White House to travel to Northern Ireland for a summit meeting with his coalition partner, British Prime Minister Tony Blair. 7.20 a.m., U.S. Central Command says even though U.S. forces have taken over one of Saddam Hussein's presidential palaces, they're not hunting for any particular individual. Instead, says Brigadier General Vincent Brooks, the coalition is focused on the regime. Brooks also says he cannot confirm the death of Ali Hassan al-Majid. 9.17 a.m., Martin Savage traveling with the 7th Marines shows new video of U.S. Marines searching the Iraqi Atomic Energy Commission headquarters near Baghdad. A scientific team will analyze the substances found in laboratories there. And you're looking at live pictures now of Air Force One now on the ground uh, at a Royal Air Force base outside of Belfast, Northern Ireland. It's called uh, Alder Grove, RAF Alder Grove. That's just outside Belfast. The President of the United States coming for a brief two-day summit with the British Prime Minister Tony Blair. They'll be talking about a post-war Iraq, among other important subjects. They'll also have an opportunity to review the uh, so-called roadmap 
for Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations to get off the ground. They also want to uh, review what the status is of Northern Ireland right now, as that peace process seems to be taking hold, been relatively quiet in Northern Ireland over the past few years. This is the third time in as many weeks that President Bush and Prime Minister Blair will be sitting down to review strategy, war strategy, uh, as they go forward together, go forward as close allies in trying to help put together a new Iraq. There are some significant differences in their strategy, uh, including what role precisely the United Nations should have in determining the future of Iraq. They'll try to thrash all of that out. Uh, you're looking at this picture of Air Force One taxiing in on the tarmac, getting ready for the president. As we watch this picture uh, of the Air Force One getting, uh, getting uh, into uh, this airport, I want to bring in our military analyst, uh, General Dan Chrisman, to go over what's happening in Baghdad. Seems pretty far away from Belfast right now, uh, General, but decisions that these two leaders make could have a significant impact on the future of Iraq. First of all, General, we'll keep this picture up of Air Force One. Talk to us a little bit about what you sense is happening on the streets of Baghdad right now. Wolf, it's clearly the final phase. It's clearly the end game which is unfolding right now. I think it's very significant, not only in Baghdad, but Basra itself. But you have coalition forces there in some strength. Apparently at least three battalions of the U.S. 3rd Division in Baghdad, three uh, coalition assets, three uh, huge battle groups in Basra itself, which the U.K. has there. What they've developed here, Wolf, over these last several weeks, indeed, is very uh, clear and increasingly clear intelligence as to what the final remnants of the, of the regime leadership are in terms of where they are embedded in these cities. And what they're doing is going in now very carefully, obviously some symbolic raids against palaces, but the more important presence is to go after what intelligence delivers, and that's where these key leaders are located. They're going to be defended fanatically, but the intelligence is so crucial from aerial platforms and special ops personnel to give these assets, the three battalions and three battle groups, the intel which they need to close with and eliminate these final remnants of the regime in those cities. So this is a very important final phase here, uh, Wolf, and it looks like the closure is coming in here now much more rapidly than we had, uh, had anticipated. And as we continue to watch uh, Air Force One now on the ground outside Belfast, North, Northern Ireland, we'll be watching President Bush uh, emerge from that plane momentarily. We'll continue to have live coverage of that. General Crispin, when Walter Rogers, our embedded reporter with the 37th Cavalry, Cavalry says that three battalions uh, of troops are now on the ground in, inside Baghdad itself and have taken up positions, they're going to spend the night there, presumably. How many, uh, how many soldiers are we talking about right now? Between 700 and 1,000. The task forces really, uh, Wolf, are probably built around the M2 Bradley, that's the basic infantry fighting vehicle. It is the equipment of choice for a task force like this to go into Baghdad. Its cannon, its ability to uh, emplace troops and fire through the firing ports in that Bradley vehicle, to take them in under protection, it's a very, very important piece of equipment. And so these are probably mechanized heavy task forces that have overhead some aerial platforms to provide direct support. I think it's significant, uh, Wolf, that the degradation of the Iraqi air defenses has now allowed A-10s, Predators, U-2s, other assets to hover and loiter and provide the overhead protection to these task forces. But it's built around that mechanized infantry basis. And besides the Bradley, the most important asset is that individual infantry soldier himself. It's equipped with the kind of weapons that are really suitable for direct engagement in the cities. His rifle, a Dragon uh, missile that can knock down doors and walls. It's a very, very powerful task force, and as the intelligence develops, it's likely to grow here substantially as these days wear on. Well, assuming, General, that the Iraqis put up a fight, those Bradley, uh, those armored personnel carriers, as well as the M1A1 uh, Abrams battle tanks that are moving in and out of Baghdad, and the air cover that they have, the helicopters, the fixed wing support, how vulnerable are they to our existing Iraqi capabilities as far as your assessment is concerned? Well, the coalition spokesmen have continued to remind audiences that notwithstanding the defeat of the Republican Guard, the special Republican Guard and these Fedayeen uh, fighters and the Ba'athist security elements, they can still provide some threat. We saw, for example, the attack against the tactical operations center of the 2nd Brigade 3ID. 
But in the future, Wolf, these uh, direct fire engagements from the Iraqis who are remaining will not be with tanks and artillery systems and even heavy mortars. They're going to be with the smaller pieces of equipment, still lethal at close range. The Kalashnikovs, their RPGs, some shoulder-fired weapons that can go against armored vehicles. Those are the kinds of things that will be of immediate concern to the soldiers as they close with and destroy these, these remnants. That's the big issue right now. And of course, the key to take them out is to have the kind of recce and aerial surveillance plus special ops personnel. I can't emphasize too much how embedding the special ops personnel in this city there for some time can develop the kind of intelligence against these remaining nodes and eliminate them as the coalition closes with these final elements. I just want to remind our viewers, for those who are maybe just tuning in, this is Air Force One. It's touched down at this Royal Air Force uh, base just outside uh, Belfast. The president should be emerging through that door of momentarily walking down the steps uh, to begin talks, serious talks with the British Prime Minister Tony Blair on the future of Iraq, a post-war Iraq. There he is, the President of the United States uh, emerging from Air Force One. Uh, he'll be going over to begin his meetings with Prime Minister Blair. Not very fancy arrival ceremonies expected here at uh, this RAF Alder Grove uh, base in Northern Ireland. Uh, symbolically, uh, symbolically, it's been important for the British Prime Minister especially to have this meeting in Northern Ireland. Uh, as many of our viewers remember, it's been the British Prime Minister who's been coming over to Washington in recent weeks to meet with the President. Now it's the President's turn to make the trip across the Atlantic to meet with the uh, Prime Minister. There's Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, who's joined the President on this important mission. Uh, General Crispin, I'm going to uh, wrap it up with you and uh, we'll talk a little bit later. Thanks very much for your expertise. Uh, plenty to talk about. Judy, as we watch these pictures of the president, uh, this is an important meeting for him. I think it's premature to say this is a sort of lip victory lap for him and the prime minister, but there's no doubt that the president is clearly happy the way this war is unfolding. That's right, and as we've, uh, as we've been listening to our colleague uh, John King, Wolf, uh, too early to say a victory lap because there's still hard fighting uh, to come in Baghdad, but overall the war is very much going the way the coalition would have wanted. Uh, of course, they would have liked it to go faster, but it is very much falling in their direction. Uh, President, President Bush, uh, they're meeting a small group of people, as Wolf said, not a fancy uh, greeting ceremony. Uh, this is all business, uh, you might say. President meeting with uh, the British Prime Minister uh, and others to talk about the, the end of this war as it uh, comes to a close and about what happens to Iraq after, as well as the Middle East and Northern Ireland issues. So a full agenda for the President, the Prime Minister, and the others who are meeting with them. As we watch these live pictures from Northern Ireland, President Bush uh, shaking some hands, we're going to turn at the bottom of the hour to Heidi Collins for the headlines right now. Thank you, Judy. Coming up now at this hour, British forces make a front door entrance at a presidential palace in Basra. After rolling into Basra yesterday, the British are attempting to secure the city today. CNN's Diana Muriel reports the British fighters are spread too thin to even attempt to quell widespread looting. On the northern front now, a huge set of explosions today in one of the major cities there. CNN's Jana Raff reports the blasts occurred at a weapons dump in Mosul, a city on the target list of coal coalition warplanes. In Baghdad, CNN's Walter Rogers reports three army battalions have established positions inside the Iraqi capital. The units went in with other American fighters today, but did not withdraw. CNN's Barbara Starr reports from the Pentagon, the U.S. presence inside the Iraqi capital is likely to grow. To some other news now, despite a wave of reports from other countries, Americans say they are not especially worried about the highly contagious respiratory illness known as SARS. Question for a CNN USA Today Gallup poll, 10% said the illness makes them very worried. 27% called themselves somewhat worried, but 63% said they are not worried at all. SARS has killed at least 100 people in Asia and Canada and has sickened more than 2,400 worldwide. Now, coming up next on CNN, from the Pentagon, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld updates us on the fighting on the front lines. We'll bring that briefing to you live. 
And what happens in Iraq after Saddam Hussein is out? It depends on who you talk to. We'll get the view from the State Department. And seeking out the enemy among civilians. CNN's Alessio Vinci, embedded with the Marines in central Iraq, brings us their experience. Our coverage of the war in Iraq continues now with Judy Woodruff in Washington. Looking ahead to after the war, how long will the U.S. be in Iraq? And what type of government is ahead for the Iraqi people? Joining me now to talk about that is Joshua Moravchak. He is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. His most recent book is Heaven on Earth, The Rise and Fall of Socialism. Mr. Moravchak, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me on. The war is still going on, of course. We don't know how much longer the fighting will continue, but already coalition forces very much involved in planning a post-war Iraq. What do you think are the most important first steps that will need to be taken care of when victory is finally declared? Well, the first steps are going to be just uh, to provide security for Iraq. There's no longer going to be a, a government there, and we need to provide both internal and uh, external security uh, for the country, and then to uh, make possible a rapid, large-scale introduction of humanitarian assistance for the population. And, and at what point, of course, there's a lot of speculation about a transition to democracy, uh, turning Iraq from a, uh, a government run by a dictator to one where the people have a voice. Are those kinds of concerns even going to be able to be dealt with in the early stages after the war? Well, the first steps uh, have to be taken. Uh, it's going to be a process that will take some time. Uh, we need not just a new government in Iraq, but a new political system, a democratic political system. And the first step is to uh, uh, try to help uh, Iraqis uh, develop a new constitution. And, and that's not just Iraqis, but a representative group of Iraqis. As you know, Mr. Ravchuk, Mr. Moravchuk, there's a divide between uh, the United States and others, including to a large degree the British under Prime Minister Tony Blair about the role that the United Nations and other countries should play. Uh, to what extent do you believe it is primarily the U.S. that should be calling the shots after this war is over? Well, I think it has to be the U.S. and, our, and Britain and our, our allies. Uh, the U.N. is an institution with a very checkered record and uh, one area in which it's been particularly bad uh, is Iraq. A second area in which it's particularly bad is human rights. The UN Human Rights Commission is meeting even as we speak with the dictator Muammar Gaddafi as the chairing uh, nation. So I think if there's going to be a hope for democracy in Iraq, it's going to come from uh, a first initial control by the U.S. and our allies, and then handing of power over to Iraqis, not to some other outside force. But what would you say to the United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan, who said today, among other things, that he thinks that the UN should play an important role in rebuilding uh, Iraq after this war is over? Well, the UN should play a role in the humanitarian work, but it should not have any power in Iraq. Mr. Annan himself has a really dismal record in regard to uh, Iraq. He's one of the ones responsible for getting us to this current war. If you recall in 1998, when uh, Saddam Hussein threw the uh, weapons inspectors out of Iraq and we threatened, uh, the President Clinton threatened retaliation to try to force them back, it was Mr. Annan who ran off to Baghdad, made a completely fake agreement, announced that uh, Saddam Hussein was a man he could do business with. So he's really just had very poor judgment uh, on this issue uh, all the way through, and it would be utterly senseless for us to put authority into his hands. But it's not only Mr. Annan himself, That's it's right. the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, and others who are arguing uh, that the, the mix of leadership in Iraq should include the UN. Well, uh, I think that's just wrong. The UN has uh, a, a very sorry record on this issue. Uh, right now, there's a, going to be, in the immediate aftermath, a need for securing the country. Uh, the only people who can do that are ourselves, plus our allies, notably the British, uh, who, who are going to be there in force. Bringing in the UN in a political role simply means sort of putting a UN hat on top of American forces, and that's only going to make for uh, uh, confusion and uh, 
and disrupted communications. The proper role for the UN, and one of the things it's good at, is uh, humanitarian relief. And I think uh, there are things already underway to bring in the UN in that kind of capacity. We've been talking with Joshua Moravchek. He is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, also an author. Mr. Moravchek, thank you very much. And Wolf, as I come back to you, I think we're just beginning to hear uh, just how fierce the disagreement is going to be, uh, whether it's played out between Mr. Bush and Mr. Blair uh, over what happens, what a post-war Iraq looks like. Some, some people suggesting, uh, Judy, the hard work is only just beginning and trying to determine what happens next after this military uh, coalition gets its work done. We'll be watching, obviously, very closely. We'll see if, uh, if uh, the uh, president and the prime minister work out any differences they might have. I want to immediately uh, go to uh, Barbara Starr, a Pentagon correspondent over at the Pentagon. She's got some new news. She's got some developments unfolding on her end. Barbara. Wolf, CNN has confirmed that yesterday elements of the 101st Airborne Division went to a training camp, a paramilitary training camp in southern Iraq, and found some material that they now believe may, they have not confirmed, but may have been chemical weapons material. The finding is serious enough that samples are being flown back to the United States for further study. This was a paramilitary training camp at a place called Hindia. They came across a number of 20-gallon and 55-gallon drums, and they found items that they now believe were tabin and sarin, which is a nerve agent and blister agents, possibly mustard gas. When the 101st Airborne came across this material, they called in some Fox vehicles, which do air and soil sampling. They got a positive reading, but now they want to send the material back to the United States for very specific laboratory analysis. When we asked one military official if this was the smoking gun, he said he was not prepared to go that far, but he said, it has potential. Wolf. A quick question, uh, Barbara. This is obviously potentially a very, very significant development if, in fact, it is what the suspicion is. And let's remind our viewers, this is still a suspicion. More tests have to be concluded. But as far as they're telling you, have, as, have these, uh, the tablet and the sarin, were they the raw precursor chemicals or were they the actual weaponized versions, the, the, the material that could cause, obviously, enormous damage to, uh, to, uh, to U.S. or coalition forces? Well, we don't know at this point if it was in a precursor uh, stage. In other words, if it had to be mixed together and finally put into a weaponized version. We don't know that. What we do know, it was found in a number of barrels, so there was some sort of significant amount. We are told this was not a laboratory, this was not a classroom, not, not teaching material for chemical defense, as some other findings have been. They are sending it back to the United States for further testing. Uh, it is sometimes the case, of course, with initial samplings that you get false positives. So officials are being very cautious, but at the moment this paramilitary training camp site is secured. Forces are being very careful uh, about moving through the area because they simply don't know at this point. They have a positive reading and they believe there may be some indication that it is this material, but they want to make absolutely sure. Wolf. And, and Barbara, where exactly uh, was it found? You mentioned the name of a village, Ahindia, I think you said. Uh, is, where, is that, where is that near? Well, the 101st Airborne has been moving, this element of the 101st Airborne has been moving through the Karbala region uh, south of Baghdad. They've been in and out of a number of sites. Earlier in the weekend, for example, they went to another facility, thought they had encountered something, and later discovered it was pesticide. Another reason for caution. They believe, again, that this paramilitary training camp, that the barrels that the positive reading they got for nerve agent and blister agent uh, is something to be concerned about, but they're trying to verify it now. All right, uh, a potentially very, very significant uh, development in this war. Now, week three of this war, our Barbara Starr reporting from the Pentagon. There's some suspicion that perhaps mustard gas, tab and sarin, was found, in fact, in significant quantities at this location outside of Karbala. Uh, we're going to continue to monitor the, this development. Maybe we'll get some additional information at the top of the hour. There will be a Pentagon briefing. The Defense Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, 
General Richard Myers will be coming into the Pentagon briefing room answering reporters' questions. We'll see what they have to say on this potential development. Has the U.S. military found the so-called smoking gun, confirming the Iraqis didn't have, did indeed have, banned weapons of mass destruction, in this particular case, chemical weapons? We'll continue to monitor the story and get some more information. In the meantime, just ahead, from statues to palaces, coalition forces target some high-profile symbols of Saddam Hussein's regime. We're only about 13 or 14 minutes away from the top of the hour. That's when we expect the Defense Secretary and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to come into the Pentagon briefing room, answer reporters' questions on this day in the war in Iraq. It's shaping up as a very, very significant day. You just heard our Pentagon correspondent, Barbara Starr, report potentially huge news. The U.S. suspects they might have found what they call the so-called smoking gun. Just a suspicion right now, banned chemical weapons found at a location near near Karbala. Just the suspicion they, they need to go ahead, send this material back to the United States for more tests if in fact it is mustard gas or sarin or tab and other banned chemical weapons. It would be a significant development in the war. We're also watching other major developments including in Baghdad where U.S. troops today sent a significant psychological message to the Iraqi leadership st striking at the very symbolic heart of Saddam Hussein's regime. Joining me now to talk about that, seen as Rula Amin She's in Ruayshed, along the border with Iraq in Jordan. Uh, Rula, a significant development, symbolic, but there could be some practical uh, military value for the U.S. establishing these positions right in the heart of Baghdad. Yes, Wolf, indeed. However, it also may indicate the start of a new battle and urban warfare in Baghdad. This may be the case. We do know that as it stands now, there is fierce fighting in the Iraqi capital. The main battle in this war is now being fought on the streets of Baghdad. Big explosions. Some are around the presidential compound and a Rashid hotel where most of the U.S. troops are positioned and some are in, in some residential buildings, uh, neighborhoods, like Al-Mansur neighborhood. In that neighborhood, residents say that a coalition missile had hit the neighborhood. Three houses were demolished. A huge crater, a crater was seen there, indicating that a large missile or a large bomb had caused that damage. Nine people, we are told, have been killed. They belong to two families. Now, hospitals are overwhelmed. The Red Cross says dozens of wounded are reaching the hospitals. They expect more as the fighting continues between the Iraqi forces and the U.S. troops. Now, the troops, when they went in in the morning, they did say there was some Iraqi resistance, but they were able to overcome it. And that was the message to the Iraqi residents of the capital. The regime is over and there's no use now. There's no, no point in fighting. The Iraqi officials insist that is not the case. They are still in control. The Iraqi troops have been fighting. They have inflicted a serious damage among the U.S. troops, killing a number of soldiers and wounding others. The Minister of Information, uh, Mohammed Saeed al-Suhaf, had this to say as he was standing in the Palestine Hotel just across the Tigris River where the U.S. tanks and soldiers were standing by. They pushed a few of their armored carriers and some tanks with their with their soldiers we besieged them and we killed most of them and i think we will finish them soon my feelings as as usual we will slaughter them all those invaders their tombs will be here in iraq this strong rhetoric residents of Baghdad have been hearing for the past few weeks. However, today they were asking, where is the army? Where is the Republican Guards? How come the U.S. troops were able to come in so quickly? Some soldiers have fled the scenes of the battles. Some have jumped into the river. However, we do know Republican Guards, ruling Ba'ath Party militias, and Fida'i in Saddam are still on the streets. And the residents there are wondering, is this going to be the end of a quick takeover of Baghdad? or is it going to be the beginning of an urban warfare in their own neighborhoods? Wolf? Rula Amin watching the situation from her monitoring post along the border between Jordan and Iraq. Rula, thanks very much. Let's get back to Judy in Washington. 
Thanks, Wolf. Uh, we heard Rula describe uh, the coalition move into Baghdad, the fact that they've taken over one of the major Saddam Hussein palaces there. There's now evidence that while much of his countrymen were languishing in poverty, Saddam Hussein lived a life of luxury and opulence in his many palaces scattered across the country. British journalist David Bowden takes us on a tour of one such palace from the coalition's newly captured town of Basra. Come with me and let me show you what Saddam Hussein has spent some of his smuggled oil revenue on. This, remember, just one of his palaces here in Basra. We go through the big, heavy front door and into a vast entrance hallway. On the floor, as everywhere throughout, marble flooring and intricate detailing. And as we move towards the stairs, you can see throughout the house more marble, more beautiful woodwork, beautiful panelling. Every tread on the stairs is marble, as far as I can work out. The detail on some of the panelling is magnificent. Somebody spent a lot of time and a lot of Saddam's money on detailing all of this beautiful, beautiful marquetry. As we move around the corner, the crunch of glass. When the military came in here, they weren't to know that there was no opposition. But when they got here, Saddam wasn't at home. Again, perhaps ironic given what's happened. Is that a white dove of peace on Saddam's wall? Who knows? Moving further up, again, you're taken in just by the vast size of the, the area of this place. But for me, the best part of this house, the most beautiful part, is this delicate, almost dovecot-like roof space. Beautiful stained glass intricate tile work, pastel colors. As you move through, again, the openness. There's not a stick of furniture in this house at all. Nobody has lived here, certainly in the last few months, I suspect, probably never. But if you wanted to go to the loo while you were here, there's one for every room, and not just any old toilet. This is what passes as a WC in Saddam's house. I'm no expert, but these fittings look at the very least, to be made of gold plate, if not the real McCoy all the way through. But let me show you, when they say buying a house is all about location, 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 look at the location Saddam built his house here in Basra. Again, as we wander through, marvel at the detailing, the beautiful floor work, the beautiful detailed tooling on all this woodwork. But then come into what must be a sunroom, somewhere to take your afternoon tea while you're talking to your generals. And walk out here onto the terrace and you'll see the beautiful vista, the palm trees in the distance, and in the forefront, the Shat al Arab, boats plowing up and down it. That way you can see the small fishing vessels. And if we pan round to the other side, down there, is downtown Basra. And who lives in a place like this? Well, Saddam Hussein lives in a place like this. That's who. British journalist uh, Michael Bowden, David Bowden, I'm sorry, taking us on a tour of an, an eye-opening tour of one of Saddam Hussein's opulent places of residence. Well, we just uh, showed you the inside of one of those palaces. Now we want to take you on a virtual tour of a bunker inside another one. Rene San Miguel will be your guide. He joins us from Atlanta. Rene? Well, Judy, we just saw uh, David Bowden showing us the opulence inside that presidential palace in Basra. We want to show you, uh, we have some video of, of uh, some similar opulence found in Baghdad. This is a satellite imagery from earthviewer.com and digitalglobe.com. Just to give you an idea of just how far the coalition has struck deep into the heart of Baghdad itself. That, uh, uh, that uh, palace you just saw in Basra, about 30 acres. This one also a couple of dozen acres as well. And it is right. It is the old presidential palace, also called the Republican Palace. Let's show you some video that was uh, taken early today when the uh, U.S. forces entered this uh, presidential palace. As one Pentagon official told uh, CNN early today, quote, it can't be anything but alarming to see a coalition brigade commander standing in the compound of a presidential palace in Baghdad. Now, this is still, this palace is still in the process of uh, what the military calls exploitation, just a fancy word for investigation, trying to dig up documents, but there you see the toilet. 
Also some very ornate fixtures in there and some of the, uh, the uh, paintings and uh, photographs in there celebrating the leader of the Iraqi regime. Now this is uh, one of the, uh, one of the, just one of the presidential palaces. There's some 57 in the entire country and, uh, and uh, a handful in the city of Baghdad itself. People are wondering, well, if Saddam Hussein did survive that March uh, 17th, or March 19th decapitation strike, how could he have done it? This is some information that we have gleaned from a uh, German firm that was said to have built a bunker for Saddam Hussein at a cost of $150 million, and um, it is uh, said to be about 19,000 square feet. Just an idea, that's, uh, that's bigger than about 10 average family houses you'd find in America. Two dozen rooms, access by stairs or elevators. Supplies are, having to, are driven down in a truck, down a, a ramp. The ceilings, six feet thick, reinforced concrete. The walls, five feet thick. Some of the rooms are set on springs so that they can withstand uh, a major attack from a coalition a bunker buster bomb. Uh, one uh, lead engineer for this project, for this German firm that built the uh, bunker, has told the Sunday Times of London the coalition would have to hit this site with Tomahawk cruise missiles 16 times at the same spot to get through. But as you know, since 1991, that's why the coalition developed the bunker busters, was to get through that kind of protection afforded by Saddam Hussein. Wolf, back to you. Renee San Miguel, thanks very much. Fascinating material, enough uh, material to digest and to try to absorb. We're going to be learning a lot about these uh, developments over the next several days. Uh, we're waiting for an important Pentagon briefing. That's due to begin right at the top of the hour within the next few minutes. We're expecting to hear directly from the Defense Secretary and the uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In the meantime, there's a developing breaking news story. We're covering the possibility, possibility that US, the U.S. military, the 101st Airborne in particular, may have found the so-called smoking gun, some chemical weapons banned, banned chemical weapons near Karbala. Terrence Taylor is a former U.N. weapons inspector. He's joining me now on the phone. Uh, Mr. Taylor, thanks as usual for joining us. Our Barbara Starr at the Pentagon uh, saying that there is a deep suspicion that they found some significant quantities of sarin uh, tabin this uh, mustard gas uh, at this location near Karbala. Uh, I don't know if you heard a report, but what is your sense? How quickly would they know whether or not this is in fact chemical weaponry? Well, if it's a substantial amount and if it's in large drums, which I understand it, it might be, uh, they could, I think, with field testing, find out pretty quickly. Uh, what has been difficult with other uh, stories we had is just having small trace elements. But if it's a substantial quantity, we should find out uh, what I hear so far, that it's probably, a, 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 that it might be, I stress might, of course, uh, be a kind of nerve agent, either sarin or, or taboon of that type, which is a lethal uh, nerve agent, so-called, um, which we knew the Iraqis did have in, in their arsenal. There is another type of agent they have, which is mustard agent, uh, which is a different kind of uh, way it operates. It, it burns uh, the skin very badly indeed, and of course burns the lungs if you inhale the vapor. So that's a different type of chemical warfare agent. And we should caution our viewers and, and let them know that there have been some false alarms over the past few days. Other suspicions that perhaps some chemical weapons were found only to discover they weren't banned chemical weapons at all. In this particular case, Mr. Taylor, Barbara Starr is reporting that they want to bring some samples back to the United States for some sophisticated testing. What does that suggest to you that they want to, they have to test it back in the United States? Well, certainly it has to be tested in best possible uh, conditions and laboratory a test gives you a, you know, a, an absolutely clear indication of what it is we're looking at. I think the international community has to be satisfied here. So I think it's particularly important to get the sampling right, get the testing right, and maybe, uh, I don't know what the U.S. policy would be, but uh, they would probably have to uh, get others to test the samples as well. If they found this uh, ner nerve agent, one of the nerve agents, and we're saying if because uh, we don't know for sure, in these big drums, in significant amounts, would that be the weaponized agent ready to go into an artillery shell or some sort of missile? Or, or would they be the sort of uh, step before the actual agent became weaponized? Well, if uh, the story is correct, and you're, you're right to introduce a lot of caution here, and it is indeed sarin or, or taboon nerve agent, then it is uh, what we would call bulk agent uh, ready to be poured into munitions, which might be 
the 122 millimeter rockets, which you've heard about before, or artillery rounds, or other missile warheads. And I would expect the Iraqis to hold uh, bulk stocks of agent like this uh, in certain uh, locations, uh, and then they'd have to fill the, the rounds. So I think you'd expect to find a mixture of filled munitions and uh, drums of agent uh, that is ready for use, essentially. What, would, what else would you expect to see at a location like this, Mr. Taylor, if in fact these uh, are the nerve agents, the banned chemical weapons? What other equipment, protective gear, might the Iraqis have at a location like this that would be additional evidence that they were planning on use this in some sort of military encounter? Well, uh, I would expect, of course, to, to find uh, protective equipment uh, with the personnel that might be handling this, whether that would be stored at the location or somewhere else, it's hard to tell. There might also be what one might call filling frames or apparatus for filling munitions. If you're going to fill an aerial delivered bomb, for example, you need to hold the munition in a filling frame and then fill the agent or fill the warhead. So there's various bits of paraphernalia that you would need uh, to fill the munitions. But I think one has to be careful about that because I would suspect the Iraqis would hold the bulk agent probably at a variety of locations and the munitions at, at separate locations. So I, I think this is a tough one to call just at the moment. All right, uh, Terrence Taylor, a former UN weapons inspector, knows a great deal about this material, uh, potentially huge development in this war. Mr. Taylor, thanks very much. I just want to caution our viewers, not 100% confirmation by any means, more testing required, but perhaps, perhaps the 101st Airborne Division, elements of that division have found the so-called smoking gun, Iraqi banned chemical weapons at a location near Karbala, uh, in central Iraq. We'll continue to monitor that story. We're standing by for this Pentagon briefing expected to start very, very soon within the next few minutes. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Defense Secretary, I'm sure they'll be asked questions about this. We'll see what they say. We'll go to the Pentagon as soon as that briefing begins. In the mean meantime, let's check the latest developments at this hour. Let's go to CNN's Heidi Collins. Thank you, Wolf, and hello from the CNN Newsroom in Atlanta. Here's what's happening at this hour in the war in Iraq. The Pentagon calls it a powerful message. Coalition troops and armor rolling headlong into Saddam Hussein's newest presidential palace in Baghdad. CNN crews report mass desertions among Iraqi defenders, though an Iraqi missile killed at least two GIs just south of the city. Two journalists also reported killed. This is Basra. British troops are sending a message of their own this hour in another presidential palace, as in much of this large southern city. The Brits maintain they've also found the body of the Iraqi leader known as Chemical Ali, but the U.S. will not confirm Ali is dead. One of the best-known Iraqi opposition leaders is in the southern Iraqi city of Nazaria this hour, leading hundreds of fighters dubbed the Free, Free Iraqi Forces. Amir Shalabi of the Iraqi National Congress says his men will fight alongside the coalition under coalition command. And the two main coalition political leaders are meeting face to face today for the third time in less than a month. President Bush and British Prime Minister Tony Blair are in Hillsborough Castle.